I want to call Matt Bray, Marjorie Bray. Oh, my dear, it's beautiful, Matt. How are you doing? I'm great. Oh great. Lovely to see you again. I know. So Matt was part of the, my first Grand Mad March event, and it was a success. And she chanted like an angel, and she's this beautiful, amazing woman that actually I met through Rebecca. So before I forward like to you, I give it back to you, Matt. I want to just do a brief introduction. And I guess there is like a background noise. Just check if there is something that you can do there. Um, Madge, she would, we call it Madge Bray, and she was born Marjorie Allen into a Scottish Highland family of traditional singers, poets, musicians, and storytellers. And her mother sang to her in the womb and on the breast. Imagine how beautiful is that. And this rich song legacy has accompanied and sustained her at pivotal moments through her lifetime of working with human trauma internationally. She's a traditional singer with family roots in the Northeast of Scotland, like I just said. She's also a researcher, trauma therapist. She went on to explore human harmony in sound and immersed herself in the Georgian songs and Kenyan rituals. And she she's the founder of the traditional Futures Channel, this is a space to preserve and share the Scottish oral tradition and cultural inheritance. And we will be sharing shortly here um, the link so you can all join. And today she will focus on song, sound, and vibration as a container for grief. So much it's my pleasure to have you here. And please like honor us with that chanting. And then you can just, you know, let tell us a little bit of what does it mean and a little about your work. Okay, thank you, thank you. And what a pleasure and a joy to be here. I'm really delighted. So I'm just going to begin, I think, with something that is very ancient. Um, this is from 1492 or around that time. And this is a, an ancient chant that is held in our Scots bagpipes. It's an ancient song stream. And I'm going to chant it now. Um, and I'm going to chant it in a way that with what's called vocables, which are the sounds that, that the early bagpipe um, geniuses really transmitted to their pupils. This is how the music was taught. It was taught through sounds, it was sung. And I'm going to chant it now in that way. This is the part P brock. I'm going to chant a part of it. It's about 15 minutes long in total if you were a piper piping this. But I'm going to chant just part of this. And in the sounds that I'm making, I'd like you to listen for some of the sounds of grieving. I'd like you to listen for shrieking. I'd like you, like you to listen for a litany, a grief litany. And I'd like you to listen potentially for sobbing too. These are all in my humble view held in this. It's strong stuff, so brace yourselves. <clears throat> Ara <laughs> Ara ro, 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 ara ro
a gloria, ra ura 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 a glory, a glory, a ura 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 a glory, a glory, a glory, a ura 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 Adrori, aro, adri, adri, ro, 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 ro. I know like this is just more than a chanting or keening. This is a download that you always do and it's such an inspiration and connection to your ancestral traditions. Uh, please share with all of us. Yeah, I, I would like to tell you a story about this that helped me to reach the point where I could um, step aside and allow this to come through. Um, so I was a young woman, young woman, and I was training to be a social worker in the very early days of my life. And I went across to the Outer Hebrides um, and I was, I was given a, a bunch of people, maybe six or eight different cases, which were what people called them in those days, they were cases. And I had to go and deal with these cases. And um, I went to one of the cases and she was an elderly lady. She must have been about 80. And um, I went, I didn't have any Gaelic or very little Gaelic and she didn't have any English, but she was a kind of a local kind of nuisance. Um, she was seen as quite deranged. She would walk about, she's a little wee wiry woman and she would walk about and she would steal milk bottle tops. And um, she would take, she'd take the tops off milk bottles because there was milk bottles on doorsteps in those days. And she would steal the insides of cigarette packets and she'd take them home and she'd stash them in her house. And so when you went into her house, her house was, you had to wade through, it was up to your knees, this, uh, you know, floor full of these things. And when I got into the, I, I, she welcomed me in and I went in and I had no idea, I was 21, I think, or 22 maybe. And she, there's a, just, just a living room with floorboards and maybe a couple of chairs and a, a fire with peats. Um, a peat fire and um, suddenly this old lady started to do this and she was hammering and this sound was going right through me and I had no idea what she was doing and I was terrified to be honest anyway I didn't know what was going on so I um 
I, I got on my hands and knees and did the same. I just did exactly the same. I just mirrored her. Just because my intuition told me to do it, but I, it, I never read anything about how you deal with these situations in the textbooks because nobody taught you these things. And I was really scared. <laughs> but for eight, for eight or ten weeks, I went to her house. I was ushered in and the same thing happened. This wailing, but not just wailing, rhythmic and sound and song in the wailing. And I had no idea. And, and, I, and I would go home really scared because I was doing the wrong thing and maybe I wasn't supposed to be doing this and if anybody found out that I was going to someone's house and hammering the ground and wailing and screeching it really was I'm going I was not going to get through my exams so I wrote words like Uncon I'm giving her unconditional positive regard and prayed a lot at the time <clears throat> and on the last day when I went to I was in the office I was leaving I said to one of my colleagues who lived there, I said, you know, I'd be really sorry to leave this lady because every time, every time at the end of this, she would come up to me and I would just give her a hug and she'd be crying. And, um, and anyway, I said to this person, you know, I, I, I'm be sorry to leave. And he said, oh, did you go and see her? I said, yeah. He said, oh, she was one of the Isle Air women. I said, what's an Isle Air woman? Because we didn't actually get much of our own history. We got British history, but nothing to do with Scottish history. So I didn't know much about our history, um, really. <clears throat> um, and um, what the Isle Air was, this was a tiny Hebridean island with, I don't know how many population, but no more than a few thousand. And on off that island were sent in the First World War a lot of young men because they were seamen and they were mariners and they went and they fought in the first world war and about four or five hundred of them came home and one of the ships that was taking them home on a foul night on Hogmanay which was the new year sank in the harbour and the hundred and hundreds of people were lost, men, and the women could hear their men screaming and trying to drowning. And in the morning, the women went onto the shore to drag the bodies out. And this was one of the biggest maritime disasters of the First World War, because it, there were so many people were lost in the same ship. And the pathos of it was obvious, but the island never really recovered because that grief, that enormous grief of a, a massive amount of the young men folk w w was, was, was lodged in the psyche of the people and in the, in the, in the land and in the landscape, that, that loss. And it had enormous consequences, um, one of which was that with, with a lot, because, because there was nobody marriageable, um, that a lot of young women left the island within the next 10 years, one of which was um, Donald Trump's mother. But anyway, this, ha this was a, an incredibly important event, but in those days, nobody understood post-traumatic stress. So um, I didn't either. So I was, I was holding these sounds in my mind and my body. I was a singer, I, but I never heard them before because we don't have easily containers for that level of visceral grief. I heard it again in different situations in war zones where I did bearing witness work, in trauma with children, I heard these sounds, but, but I could never find, I, words don't contain it, but sound contains it. So my life took me into the High Caucasus Mountains where I was interested in human harmony and how, how, how that culture processes its, its harmonies because in the High Caucasus Mountains, the Republic of Georgia is known as the, human, as, the, as the locus of human harmony. And in that situation, they have incredibly complex harmonics. The, the music is, is, is a, you know, it, it's an ex astonishing combination of understanding of the grist of human experience, which is all melded into the music. And in the process of that, I ended up at grief rituals in that country and I heard the same sounds. I heard them very clearly. 
And grief rituals are not something that you pitch up to go to. They're, they're, they're something that you are invited to as an honoured guest and out of love, sharing something deep, deep, deep. And it's not the kind of thing that musicologists get themselves to because it's um, because because there's very few recordings of what really happens in the music of grief. But these are eternal threads and they hold grieving. And if we cannot process our intergenerational grief, our loss, our distress, then we're then then we can't progress as human beings because they are lot because that experience is lodged in our system and ends up with warmongering, if you like. So for me it was incredibly important. I came back and I started to listen for those sounds. And I heard them, I had always heard them in the bagpipes, but I knew that there must be a song lines that came through. And in our early life, in the 14, 15, 1600s, women were grief tenders in our culture. The clan chiefs would have had their women grief tending people, and they would have held a space for that kind of collective mourning. And they would have held a space for the uncried tears and for the transition of the soul. And so I began to start beginning to form an understanding that these sounds that these women were making, these uh, that were called manahantouris, these women are making these sounds at, 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 at funerals and grief rituals, that in the 1600s that was banned by the church. So the, the, the sacred duty of the woman was taken away and the patriarchal influences changed things. But in the 1600s, 1700s, these sounds were still in the land and the landscape and the men were still hearing them. And that was the time when our, our, our highest form of piping was at its zenith, which is the most beautiful, our Pibroch laments, which are very, the, the highest quality of our traditional music. And they were they were handed down by sounds. They were they were sung to their pupils. So in, there were piping schools back in the 1600s, 1700s on these uh, on, in the Highland regions, where music was handed down through a series of what's called vocables. So I went back into that whole treasure trove of exploration and understanding and started to develop. Uh, I met a, a very important person who was probably our master piper who has the, the, the greatest understanding and knowledge of the, the early Pibroch. And I spent time with him and he said, I want to help you. And so what I'm doing now is beginning to look at early lamentation and how we can learn from that to, to bring this music as a, as a container for grief in current times. So that's my work. And once I woke up, that's what I learned. <laughs> that's what I tried to know. And that's what I'm feeling my way very carefully in. I, you know, I, I find it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not finding it always straightforward because there are very strong ways of piping that you have to do in the, in the, in the way that this music has developed. There are big competitions where you get a kilt on and you, you, you get into competition with each other and you get the best prize for the highest quality of whatever, judged by somebody external. But for me, music is not about competition. It's not about performance. It's about transmission. And so these are ancient transmissions. And when I found the capacity to stand back and allow them to come through, I'm able to use them in soul transitions wherever I get asked to be, really. Um, and, and my YouTube channel is about transmitting some, I'm building it slowly, but it, my YouTube channel is about transmitting some of, some of these, this music as a container for grief in our current times. Because if you think about our small little country, um, the iconic image is of a piper on the battlements with a kilt on, piping a pibroch lament. That's how people see Scotland. So we've got big punching to do in this. And as a woman, I want to try and reclaim it and rebalance it so that we as women can hold it for grief. And I've done quite a lot of this just myself with 
dying or people or people who were passing holding that process. And it's an honour to do it and it's an honour to share it. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it with you. God bless. And that's where I'm at. Oh, Marge, you're such a delight. I love it. <laughs> and I like, I still have not met you in person because I always was like, I want to hug you and be there with you. You know, you're so amazing. I love that smile and you're so much fun. Like everybody needs to know that because yeah, she's now doing this, all this transmission. And of course, this is a spiritual moment and blessed moment, but it's like much, it's just really something. So oh, thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much. My I pleasure. <laughs> Oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> okay, please put help me put it out, Monica. I'm just beginning this process, so I want to go uh, everywhere so that anybody can use it as a resource. There you go. We're putting right now, again, your YouTube channel is YouTube channel, youtube.com, at Traditional Futures. And there you can find all Thank that you. amazing work that she's doing. Everybody needs to see it because it's worth it. It's beautiful and amazing. So thank you much again. Thank and you. I'm okay. happy to give you the space for this. <laughs> thank you thank for joining us. God bless. Ah, da, 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 da.